<laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's all I can say. Hey, welcome, everyone. Uh, let's open up with prayer. Uh, Father God, we just thank you so much for today, God. Thank you that we can just be here this morning and be in your presence, God. And uh, God, there's so much joy already in just talking to people. There's, a, there's an excitement, God, and I just love it. God, I pray that that excitement, that joy uh, just goes throughout the whole service, God, and that we can just have some fun this morning, God. We love you and praise you. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, um, speaking of fun, if you've ever wanted to volunteer at the church, we're currently looking for some people to help out with our AV tech team, which is audiovisual. It's those people to my left. They're waving. Hi, guys. And um, they control the live stream, which we're live right now on, on Facebook and on our webpage and YouTube. They control the PowerPoint. They control the sound so you can hear me. So if that's something that you're interested in, I would, I would encourage you to fill out a Connect card or talk to Phil about it, and we'd love to get you connected. Or if you want to sing, there's beautiful voices out here. Yep. So sure let's sing. Can. Amen. See, right? <clears throat> Amen. Um, yeah, so if, if you'd like to do that, uh, I would encourage you to fill out a Connect card or, or come and talk to Phil or one of us, and, and we'll get you plugged in there. Another thing we're going to connect with is next thank you small groups okay i forgot what that was but online we've we've noticed that we only have uh our small groups in the mornings and it's kind of hard for some people who work throughout the day um and so we're we're, we're trying to take a feel of the church take a temperature of the church to see it, what days would work best for an evening studies and and how we can help improve our small groups so if you go to our website or you go to our small groups part of our website, we have uh, a survey on there for you guys to fill out. Uh, it takes less than five minutes, and uh, I would just encourage you to fill that out so that we can make small groups even better here at Rock Harbor. And if you ever wanted to join a small group, you can also fill out a Connect card and write that down, or just contact the leaders if you go to our small groups portion on our webpage. And then our, our next announcement is our virtual trip to Kenya. Now you have till Tuesday to sign up, and it's gonna it's uh it it's gonna be for a full week. It's one hour a day. You get sent stuff, so there is a little bit of homework, not too much, but uh, it, it's gonna be a great time. Um, and, and like I said, you have two days. Yeah, you have till Tuesday to sign up for that. So I'd encourage you to do that if you want to find out what we're doing in Kenya. Uh, I'd encourage you to, just to do that. And then also, three weeks from today, one week before Father's Day, June 12th, we're going to be having our church-wide barbecue. And this will be a great time in which we can all just come together and just have good food, good fellowship. There's going to be bounce houses there, there's cornhole, there's going to be uh, tisk golf. So there's going to be so much there. We just encourage you to come and, and, and hang out with us on June 12th. Well, at, at this time, uh, I... I want to introduce you guys to Larry from Gideon's International. This is a powerful book. Amen. That's what an inmate said to me when I went out to the California men's colony ministering with the Gideons. And I thought, isn't it a great privilege to be distributing God's word that provides comfort, Help in time of need and the way of salvation. Praise the Lord. As many of you may know, Gideons are Christian business and professional men who've had the same unchanging ministry of winning souls to Christ for over 100 years. Every day with your help, the Gideons on average distribute approximately 120,000 copies of God's word in hotels, motels, prisons, schools, military, and other crossroads in 200 countries. Printing in 109 languages, we are the world's largest missionary society with over 250,000 self-supporting volunteers as a missionary arm of this church. With your help, Gideons are serving around the world in areas where you or I will not be able to go. It was shared with me that since the Gideons began distributing scriptures in 1908, that it took 29 years to distribute the first million scriptures 
The next million took 13 years. Today, with your help, Gideon's distributed a million scriptures approximately every eight days. In 2014, Gideon Bible number 2B, 2 billion was distributed. Locally, we have a ministry of checking hotels and motels. There's a lot of them around here. We go from San Simeon all the way to Oceano. We try to get uh, to them every April and October. Also, we distribute testaments at Cal Poly, Cuesta College, Allen Hancock. And for the last 20 years, believe it or not, we've been out at the California Mid-State Fair. We have a booth. And uh, last year, even with the shortened hours, we were able to distribute a little bit over 1,000 uh, copies of God's Word at the, uh, at the fair. We have so many testimonies. It's funny, I picked one from Swaziland, and you guys are going on a virtual tour from Kenya. But this is from Pastor S.L. from Swaziland, and he says, As a schoolboy, I received a New Testament from the Gideons. That led to my accepting Christ. I used to read it every day, and I kept it in my pocket. I would read the Testament whenever I had time. At his first job, co-workers tried to get him fired, telling the boss I was reading the Bible rather than working. The boss confronted me, and I explained, hey, when these guys are on breaks, I read the Bible. Otherwise, I'm working. He understood. He kept on reading it and became a pastor. He goes, and now I serve a large congregation in Manzini, Swaziland. Our church members contribute offerings regularly so that more Bibles and New Testaments can be distributed. This testimony illustrates a verse that we stand on, which many of you know probably is Isaiah 55, 11. So shall the word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing I sent it. One way you can share with the Gideons is through the Gideon cards. Uh, you can give Bibles and recognition and memory. Uh, when my parents passed away, Bibles were uh, given in memory, and it's a great way to uh, share God's Word. A hotel Bible has a potential for reaching 2,000 people in its six-year lifetime. The Gideons and Rock Harbor sharing God's Word together. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite you all to stand. We'll start our service of worship. Yes, 
mighty river, come and fill me again. Come and fill me. Father, we're so grateful to be able to come to you this morning and to worship you through song. Father, your word is so clear that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so, Lord, you're right here, right in the midst of us, right in the center, the very epicenter of our worship is you. And we thank you today. Father, you're an amazing God. We bless you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, this morning I I want to start something new, and, um, you know, for the remainder of my time here, uh, Phil brought up something really cool yesterday. It was cool that his heart, it wasn't cool what was going on, but that uh, it's important for us to, you know, pray about the things that are going on culturally and uh, the things that are happening in the world. So I'd like to take a moment today to pray for the families in Texas. All of you are aware of that, that horrible, horrible incident this past week. And, you know, I, I was convicted. Sometimes we, um, the Ukraine, I mean, that's kind of, we've got on with life. Life has moved on for us, and we forget about the carnage there, or even the, the mass shooting in, in Buffalo. But I, I just think it's important for us as a church that we pray, that we ask for God's favor, God's blessing, that, that the church of Jesus Christ will rise and do what we do best, and that is to represent Jesus. So would you pray with me and, and uh, just join me? Father, we do come to you this morning, and that, that song just brought tears to my eyes, Lord, that we do need you. We, we need you, God. And Father, I, I, I pray. Lord, for uh, <clears throat> Lord, the families in Texas, God, that you, you you surround them with your grace, with your love. Father, I, I cannot even begin to imagine. None of us can. I don't believe in this room the, the horrific time they're in, and I, I pray, God, that you. Manifest yourself in an unbelievable way. Father, that the churches in the area will will come alongside and, and, Father, not provide answers, not beat them over the head with the word of God, but love them. Father, right where they are, cry with them, hold them, and process them through. And, Father, when the time comes, minister your word to them. Father, we lift up those in the Ukraine. Father, even those in Syria, the the, the garbage that has happened globally the last couple of years, God, that you would raise up your church. And Father, somehow, some way, you might be glorified. Father, we pray for those in Buffalo and Lord, just the other stuff going on, so much going on. But Lord, our, our role, our call, our privilege, Father, is to represent you as the global church of Jesus Christ to elevate the supremacy of our Lord. And so, Lord, I would pray, help us to be mindful of these things and help us to come alongside those who are are struggling greatly. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the helper, the comforter, the paracletus, the one that comes alongside, the one that lives within, and the one that empowers. So, Lord, I pray that you use the church as the vehicle that you promised you would, of course, in Matthew 16. Father, is that vehicle that will represent you and join you in your redemptive story as it is being written even today. So Lord, we thank you and we bless you. Uh, Now as we transition into a time of study, I would ask God that you would teach us about you, teach us the truths of scripture. But Father, I would pray that it would be transforming that we'd be different. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes those big words get me. Oh, well, good morning. I'm, we were uh, talking yesterday, and Phil brought up a really good point that, you know, we need to pray. And he's so right. It was such a, a good reminder. 
um, what the Lord has given us. Well, uh, good morning, church family. How are we doing? I want to see some teeth. It's a good day. The other day, I was with an old buddy, a cop, retired cop buddy of mine, and we smiled, and he goes, man, you got beautiful white teeth. We were over at Lolo's Great Restaurant, encourage you to go there, and I said, well, they're kind of yellow, man. They're coffee stained. He goes, can't you receive a compliment? So let me see your teeth. Man, you got beautiful teeth. Yours are yellow teeth. <laughs> um, today, we are in chapter four, and if you have your Bible, please turn there. We continue our are studying the book of Romans, a, a series we're calling Practical Theology, a Study of Romans. And what a, what a blessing it's been thus far. Today we're going to attempt to get all the way through chapter 4, and we're going to outline our text in two ways only. First of all, we're going to look at the examples from Scripture, the examples from Scripture, and, and then we're going to wrap it up with a great encouragement that Paul provided to the church at Rome, what I call the excellencies of Scripture. So the examples from Scripture and the excellencies of Scripture. And for the last couple of weeks, we've learned together the, the doctrine of justification and in a very simplistic way, but a very profound truth in the Word of God that because of what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary, that which we cannot do for ourselves, we've been justified in the heavenly places, just as if we had never sinned. And that is solely by faith alone that God gives to us. This biblical truth of of Paul that he presented was, was just earth-shattering to the Jewish community there in Rome because their whole foundation, their whole religiosity, their whole uh, framework for following Yahweh was to be keepers of the 613 do's and don'ts of the Torah. And, and when Paul wrote, and we looked at it last week, verse 28 of chapter 3, therefore, and he's, he's wrapping up this section, therefore, everything I've said up to this point, Church of Rome, understand this, that we conclude, we, the Holy Spirit writing through Paul, we conclude that a man, not gender specific, man and woman, is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, and, and that rocked their world. In fact, 500 years ago, we celebrated the, the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And the, the catchphrase of the Protestant Reformation was powerful. It's so true that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That salvation is, is by God's unmerited favor alone, by or through faith alone, Romans 12, that he gives us in the Messiah alone, the wonderful, iconic Bible translator who lost his life, was martyred for the faith. John Wycliffe wrote several hundred years ago, quote, trust wholly in Christ, rely altogether on his sufferings, beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by his righteousness. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for salvation. And you see, justification, just as if I'd, we'd never sinned, is the result of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it's for all who believe, for all who are granted faith. So in our text today, in Romans chapter four, just to catch up, Paul will validate his claim by using Old Testament Hebrew examples to the Jewish people to prove from Scripture that it's not something we can attain on our own, that I could do all the best I can, and that simply does not measure up. Neither did it for the Jews, neither does it for you. It's by faith through, or by grace through faith in Christ alone. And so Paul brings up five examples in our text in verses 1 through 22. So let's evaluate them, and we'll break these down together instead of reading the entire text. Let's, let's just break it down. The first example Paul uses to justify justification, to validate, to authenticate the fact that it's by, uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is the first one is Abraham, and it's 
verses 1 through 5, Romans chapter 4. Paul writes, What then shall we say that Abraham, Abraham our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham, this is Genesis 15, 6, if you're taking notes. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God. Nothing he did, he believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes, has faith on him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted as righteousness. Abraham, he's the father of the Jewish people, the Hebrew family racially. He is heralded champion as, as, as the father of the faith. And many years ago, somebody wrote, Father Abraham, Father Abraham. You know that in Sunday school day, and you probably sing that at least once a month in children's ministry. And it's so important to understand this, especially in the culture in which we live, in, in the, the way we were raised, that, that you could do it. You, 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 you tighten your chin strap. You, you tighten your belt. You could go for it. And that has leaked into one's eternal security, which isn't the case. You see, it's all about the grace God gives us. In fact, what Paul does, and I, I said it when I read the scriptures, he pulls out of the book of Genesis, something Moses wrote by oral tradition in chapter 15, verse 6. He says, and he believed in the Lord. He believed, in, and, and that's not just a, oh, I believe in God. That means a full surrendering of his will to the will of the Father. I'm embracing the God of creation. And it says here, he, God, accounted it to him for righteousness. You see, Abraham wasn't justified by his works. He was justified just as if he had never sinned. And, and he had some pretty big failures, as all of us do. He lied twice. And if you read the Genesis account, it was a big blunder. But yet God forgave him, and his righteousness was not what he did, but because he believed had his works been sufficient, Paul writes, not only could he have boasted, been braggadocious, uh, pontificate, hey, look how great I am. The reality of that, if Abraham could be justified by his works, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross would have been a radical waste of time. You see, it's interesting to me as I've studied it this week that, that Abraham was not considered righteous when he left the land of Ur to go to the land of the Chaldees in Genesis chapter 12. That was something he did. That was an act of obedience. Abraham, go to a land that you don't know, and you're going to do something that you've never done. So Abraham, as an act of obedience, he went. That was not accounted to him for righteousness. Interesting. It wasn't accounted to him for righteousness. We'll look at this in our third example for the covenant of circumcision, where, where the Lord told Abraham, you and every male must be circumcised. Every male child must be circumcised the eighth day because that's when vitamin K comes in, which is the agent that causes coagulation. Therefore, the child will not bleed out. That was an act of his faith. That wasn't a belief. That was something he did, and he was accounted righteous before that. And it wasn't even, and we'll touch on this in a little bit, where Abraham was considered righteous because he took his only son, which wasn't his only son, but the only son according to promise, Isaac, to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. That was an act of obedience. You see, these are all something he did. Abraham was considered righteous before the holy throne of Almighty God because, again, Genesis 15, 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he, God, accounted it to him for righteousness. Turn right in your Bible to Galatians chapter 3, and let's look together at verses 6 through 8. Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Now, notice the word accounted. That's an accounting term. It's real important. 
This is used 42 times in the ancient language in the book of Romans, 11 times here in chapter 4. God credited, God accounted in a, 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 an eternal ledger sheet, if you will, righteousness to Abraham. Not because of what he did, but listen closely, because of who he believed in and trusted in, of course, Almighty God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 8. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify just as if they didn't sin, justified the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you, all the nations shall be blessed. Verse 9, so that in those who are of the faith are blessed with, alongside, believing Abraham. Unbelievable. First example Paul uses to authenticate, validate, if you will, his, his claim that it's all about justification is, is right out of the Hebrew Scriptures, the one that these guys love so much, Father Abraham. His second example is found in, in verses 6 through 8 here, back to Romans chapter 4. And this example is from David. And, and David is, no question, the, probably one of the greatest kings that ever lived. Uh, David is known in Israel as just an iconic figure. If you've ever been to Israel, King David Hotel, I've stayed there once. Oh, man, it is nice. And you've got the King David Delhi, the King David uh, Road, everywhere you go in Jerusalem is all about King David. Well, it's interesting to me that King David had some colossal failures as well. And that should be a, 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 a source of strength for us, that, that, that it's all about the belief system. Yeah, Abraham had ramifications for his failure of sleeping with Bathsheba, of, of, of murdering Uriah the Hittite in the first degree. Oh yeah, that traveled with him horizontally. But vertically, when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan, he said, I have sinned against God, and God forgave him. And here, Paul uses this example to prove that you and I are justified by faith. Look at verse 6, Romans 4. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes, there's that word again, accredits righteousness apart, apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. David was, is even to this day, an all-star, the MVP of Judaism. John Corson comments on this in his commentary. He writes, quote, The idea what matters is not the rules and regulations of the law, but rather simply believing, having faith in God, and having confidence in him is not new. Look at David, founder of the royal family. Turn with me to the middle of your Bible to Psalm chapter 20 or 32. Psalm chapter 32, one of my most favorite passages in the Bible. I, I have it memorized, but I'm going to read it because I'll probably mess it up. Verse 30, or chapter 32, Psalm, verses 1 and 2. Paul quotes this in this section. And David wrote the following Blessed is the man. And blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Do you know how blessed you are today that your sins, past, present, future, Psalm 103, verse 12, are forgiven? Do you know how blessed you are that God does not even remember your sins anymore? Hebrews 10, 17. Oh, man, that, that's enough. Go home. Let's go have tacos, man. That, that's amazing. Yeah, you want to go. Okay. Amen. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord, once again, does not impute iniquity in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, the word blessed in the Hebrew language is, is oh, how happy. Not, not based upon a circumstance like I go home today and I play the lottery, which I don't, but I play the lottery and I win $25 million. That'd be cool. Well, probably not. I'd probably 
I don't know, by a boat or something. Um, that, that's like happy. Oh, wow, I could lose that tomorrow. But the happy in the Hebrew language is, oh, this, this, this fountain of joy flowing out. And David says, oh, my gosh, look what I've done. I've murdered a man. I was drunk one night when I tried to get him drunk. I, I killed him. I slept with his wife. Oh, and David had these failures, but he was not judged on his works, on the good that he did, the bad that he did. David was justified based upon his belief in Jesus Christ and his belief in the future Messiah. And he writes, oh, how happy is the man whose sin is covered. And check it out. He's writing to the Old Testament saints. Because once a year on Yom Kippur, which is usually in September, a high holiday, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and we talked about this last week, and would sprinkle blood from the sacrificial goat on the mercy seat that the sins of the Jewish people would be covered. But when Jesus Christ died on Calvary, the veil that separated the holy place to the holy of holies was ripped in part from top to bottom, meaning God the Father ripped it in half. And because of the blood, the new covenant, John 14, 15, 16, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross, Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin because of that. Folks, your sins are not covered. Amen. Your sins are gone. And how blessed. Oh, how happy, how stoked. <laughs> I can use my kids' words, man. They're millennials. I don't understand your language, dude, but you guys use it. Dad, that, that's my jam. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm forgiven. I, that's my jam. I go, is it strawberry or blueberry? No, no, that means it's cool. Okay, whatever. That, that, how amazing it is. That was dumb. Sorry. <laughs> that David writes, and we've all had a past that God imputed righteousness to him and pronounced him righteous simply because he believed in God's redemptive story. And you know, once we receive by faith, through grace, Jesus Christ, and believe in the redemptive story of Calvary's cross, listen closely, we're freed of the fetters of doing, of achieving, of performing. And that's why Paul would use one cuss word in the Bible, verse 8, chapter 3 of Philippians. He says, everything I've done is rubbish. In Greek, that means doo-doo. In other words, what John Corson would say is like, you know, we keep trying to do, do, and do, do, and do. Well, that's doo-doo. It's not what we can do. Because that's doo-doo. It's what's been done for us. Amen? Amen. And all that, the, the pressure of, I've got to accomplish this. It, we, we can't. But we could rest and have peace in the finished work of the cross for what Jesus did for us. Okay, two examples. Abraham, David. The third example is, is the, the covenant of circumcision. Look at verse 9, back to Romans 4. We have to hustle because I promised Pastor Rob I'd get through all of this. He's like, oh, you're not going to make it, man. Verse 9, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted, there's the word again, to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised. Not while circumcised, but uncircumcised. Hold on to that. Verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. That he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that the righteousness might be, once again, imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, Jewish people, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which Father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. So we ask ourselves a question. Many Jews believe that being circumcised, and as a woman circumcising your son again on the eighth day, that's going to be a righteous act that's going to give you favor with God. That again is an act of obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice, for Samuel. And many believe because of that covenant 
Abraham was righteous. But again, that was an outward act of obedience, not to obtain righteousness, but an outward act of obedience to reflect a heart that was radically in love with God. Again, Re uh, Revelation, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Go all the way back uh, to chapter 17 in, in the book of beginnings. Of course, that's the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 17, verse 10. This is huge. We have to understand the framework of the Jewish people. This was huge for them that Abraham was not deemed righteous because he was obedient to do circumcision. It was some 40 or 14 years after Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness that Abraham was obedient and celebrated the covenant of circumcision. Genesis chapter 10 or chapter 17 says this, verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants. A covenant, it's, a, it's an outward act of an inward transformation. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of your covenant between me and you. You see, it's not what we do, it's not what they did, rather it's what was done for us, what was going to be done for them. Or better put, we could put it this way, Jesus Christ did for us that which we cannot do for ourselves, And that's a huge blessing. Paul wrote in the book of Colossians chapter two, in him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And what a blessing. Our God, the Father of those, this is you and us, who walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. We have Abraham, we have David, we have circumcision. Paul masterfully is validating his statement on justification. Now we look at the law quickly, verse 13 through 17a, back to Romans chapter four. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, Faith is made void and the promise of no effect because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that we might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, quoting out of Genesis chapter 12, I have made you a father of many nations. So once again, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the fourth example. We've talked about this several times the last couple of weeks. Paul is reiterating the fact that the law cannot save us. It's righteousness that's imputed, his rightness in us, that is imputed to us by faith, not by works. And it's interesting that the law, by the way, came 500 years after Abraham and his justification in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And his righteousness didn't come from him obeying the law because there was no law yet. But yet, rather, it was by his faith. I'm not going to turn there as we don't have time, but if you're taking notes, just jot this down. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. And remember that the law is a standard. And the law is a tutor to point us to Christ. And the law shows us that we're sinners. And the law shows us our desperate need for a Messiah. And the law, when not fulfilled, brings the attribute of the Father, which is his holy just wrath. Hence the redemptive story Jesus Christ said, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. In other words, I'm the only one in the history of humanity, the God-son, the God-man, who was born of a virgin, 
That was perfect. And he's the only one that, as we learned last week, could be the propitiation, the sacrificial death for humanity. And that's why Paul would write to Titus while he was on the island of Crete. He wrote, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior uh, appeared toward man, not, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, us not receiving that which we deserve, according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been, ready? Just as if we'd never sinned, by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen? Abraham, drawn a blank. <laughs> Duh. Abraham, David, the law, circumcision, the law. And number five, Isaac, but more, more Sarah. Look at verse 17, the middle of it, through verse 22. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead, speaking of Sarah's womb, life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope and hope believed, that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old, actually 99, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20, he did not waver, listen. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that he, that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him, once again, Genesis 15, accounted to him for righteousness. Isaac was the miracle child. I don't know how many 89-year-old women you've ever seen walk around pregnant, right? Reminds me several times I've done this. Well, I've done it twice. I see gals that look pregnant, and I say, when's the baby due? I'm not pregnant. You ever done that? You'll, every man has. <laughs> I, I just, I can imagine seeing a gal this big, 89 years old, wow, miracle, impossible to have a baby. But Abraham and Sarah believed in God, going all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, that God promised Abraham, and Abraham believed it. God promised Sarah, first she laughed. Oh yeah, how could that happen? I don't think it was a sarcastic laugh, but I think she gets pregnant. And the baby of promise is born, and that's fulfilled in Genesis chapter 17. Hebrews 11, 11 says this, by faith Sarah also received strength to conceive. Strength can be defined in ancient Greek as, as, as faith to conceive. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him, God, faithful, who had promised. I lied to you. The fulfillment is in Genesis 21, verse 5. I said it was 17. Isaac was born the son of promise. Through his seed, through his lineage, Messiah would be born. Abraham was 100 years old when he had a child. Can you imagine that? I'm 61 years old. Having a baby right now? No, thank you. I love being a grandpa. Amen? Sarah was 90. Once again, in context, Paul is justifying, validating the doctrine of justification. And I think it's incredibly brilliant, wise, and Holy Spirit anointed that he would pull out of the Hebrew scriptures the reality that it's by faith through grace in Christ alone. And this morning, as, as we are real close to wrapping up, I just wonder where, where you're at in your walk with Jesus. Many of us today have put our faith and trust in Christ, and amen. 
my encouragement to you is keep walking with him. Keep, keep growing in, in your intimacy with him. Ask him for divine appointments. Let, let's not be guilty of inoculating ourselves in our Christian bubble. Let's step out of that because nothing great happens in the comfort zone. In all of these examples, these guys stepped out of their comfort zone and stepped into their faith zone, and God used them mightily. And even today, we're studying about Dave, we're studying about Sarah, we're studying about Abraham, we're studying about Isaac. Oh, man, amazing. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For those of you who have never opened up your heart to Christ, and I don't know, Everyone in this room, I know most of you, but I don't know. I don't know who's watching online. If you never opened up your heart to Jesus, man, I encourage you to do so. This world is not getting any better. And Jesus Christ loves you with a passion that you will never understand this side of eternity, but he's going to give you his love when you open up your heart to him. I'll give you an opportunity to receive Jesus in just a moment. I I wrap up with the excellencies of Scripture, and I'll be done in four minutes, I promise. We've looked at the examples from Scripture, but what what does all this mean? Look at verse 23 to 25, back to Romans 4. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. In other words, in context, all this stuff wasn't written for Abraham alone. What a phrase this is, verse 24. Verse 24. And I better get an amen or this or I'm going to leave. But also for us. Amen. Pretty weak. But also for us. These are written for our example, for our edification. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the dead, who is delivered up because of our sins. And listen, third day, raised up for just as if we had not sinned. That's the excellency of Scripture. That's the gospel message. You want to share Jesus with somebody? Read to them verse 23, 24, 25 of Romans 4. I could go on for hours with this, but I won't because Rob will win that he said you will not finish chapter 4 today. Kind of you said that. He already left. (laughs) You know, there's two reasons, I believe, that that, uh, the Holy Spirit had Paul write this. One... It is a model for us, it is a model for us who believe in Jesus, that he's the son of the living God, and his sacrifice was perfect and sufficient to grant us salvation by the faith he gave us. It's a model. We look at these men of the faith. They messed up. You mess up. I mess up. But God's a God of grace, long-suffering. And, and, and as we grow in our walk with him, sin should become more and more the exception rather than the rule in our life. And, and we begin to live, Romans eight twenty nine that we're conformed into the image of Jesus. This is written as a model for us, as an encouragement to grow in our faith with Christ. And number two, as a means for us to really embrace that cell phone, to really, <laughs> to really embrace the love of God for us. I have several scriptures I wanted to read to you, but I'm going to give them to you and give you some homework. you have a pencil? Write these down. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. I'll read some of them. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 18, 19, Paul says that that the eyes of your heart will grow in understanding. Philippians 3, 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. From where we look for the Savior, who shall come and take these vile, dying bodies and fashion them and give us new bodies that will be like Jesus's. Titus 2 verses 11 through 14, I encourage you to read that and I wrap up with this. The half brother of Jesus wrote, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory 
and majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. The excellencies of Scripture, the examples from Scripture, and our takeaway today, big idea, whatever you want to call it, man, this week, let's celebrate the excellency of our faith, the gift of faith. I read a couple of weeks ago, Micah 7, that, that, that God takes our, the sins of Israel and throws them into the ocean. You need to understand that in that day, the Jewish people were radically afraid of the ocean. They wouldn't go near it. And you know, a modern day example of this would be the following. Because of the faith that he gives, it, gives you, it's like Jesus taking all of our sins, and that's a lot, right? Take all of our sins together and put them in this big old barrel, bigger than Morro Bay, perhaps. And God takes them and casts them into a cesspool of toxic human waste. And it's as if Jesus is saying this, I'm taking your sins and putting them in a place nowhere where no one will go no one will dig them up. No one's going to snoop around and talk about them. You see, my child, I'm taking your sins and I'm casting them away, never to be remembered again because I love you. You're forgiven and the stuff you've done is forgotten because I have justified you just as if you had never sinned because of the holy sacrifice of my son on the cross. He took your sin upon himself. This is justification by faith. It's by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. Father, we thank you for the privilege that you have blessed us with, with this, this radical doctrine of justification, so profound, but yet, Lord, so simple that you look on us, those of us who are born again, as justified. You don't see our stuff. You don't see our yuck. You see Jesus. And Father, today, as a, as a community of believers, we worship you and praise you for this truth. And Lord, I would pray for those who have come today, whether they're here in the worship center or watching online, God, that you would touch their heart. And Father, give them the faith, I pray, to believe in the doctrine of justification that Jesus Christ, our Lord, took their sin upon himself, that they might have their sin forgiven and the promise of eternal life. Lord, I pray you would help them to pray to receive you even now. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please stand. I encourage you to come forward. We have a prayer team that's available to pray with you. If you're online, uh, you can fill out our electronic connect card. I guarantee somebody will get back with you today. God bless you guys. to
people sing. Out of number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and his countenance. Read it. It's beautiful. (laughs) God bless you guys. Have an amazing week. Thank you. (laughs) Deck over.